Welcome back. I'm Sam Hennett, and we have an extremely special guest for all of you today. He's been in over 30 TV shows, a dozen films, plus numerous stage credits. On top of all that, he also has a background in sports as well. I don't think we could get much of a well-rounded guest on our show. He's been a part of HBO's The Night Of and The Pacific, Agent Torque in The Mentalist, and he also played Sully in ABC's Castle. I want to introduce you to Joshua Baton. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Oh, it's good to be with you. Has acting always been something you've been interested in or did that evolve? Uh, obviously, you have other interests. So Yeah, it's, it's interesting. When I was a little kid, my father was uh, at the time an amateur photographer and he took a photograph of me that won this amateur photography competition uh, in New York City. And I guess I remember at the time, my parents got approached by a bunch of agents saying they wanted me to act. Both my parents worked. And I remember walking into the living room as like a six-year-old and, and like trying to fight to be an actor. And they, uh, they were like, no, who's going to take you to auditions? We both have jobs. My mom was a school teacher. My, my dad had a small little clothing store in Spanish Harlem. And, uh, and so it never really happened. I did school plays and this and that, but when I got, uh, when I got into high school, um, I really thought I was going to go, my, my, my hope was either to play baseball professionally, which I was not good enough to do, uh, or, uh, or to become a lawyer for like the ACLU. That was sort of where my politics aligned and, and fighting for people's rights. And then in college, I was playing college baseball and a buddy of mine uh, pushed me into taking an acting class. And I was taking this acting class um, and this girl and I were doing this improv scene and I got lost in it, like lost. I didn't know where I was. And I thought I was that she was my girlfriend and, uh, and the class started applauding and I kind of woke up and that was it. Like no more lawyer, no more anything. I was literally, I got in my undergraduate degree is in sociology because that's that I was going to use that to go into this. And I got the degree, but I also did it, did as many plays and took as many classes as I could in the world of theater, because I found this complete and utter passion for sure. Out of curiosity, then, is that how you approach all of your acting too? Are you always that deep into character? Is that something that just happens? Or have you had to like refine that? I mean, look, I, I, I went to one of the best graduate acting programs in the country after college uh, at Rutgers University, specifically trained by a man named William Esper, who was my mentor. He passed away about two years ago now. And so I definitely got some guidance and I definitely got some refinement and I got tools on how to do that. At this point, whenever I have an opportunity to act, getting that deep into it is what matters to me, you know, if, and, and the actors that I'm close with and we all approach it that way. I think to me, that's the joy of the job is you get to sort of step in other people's shoes and, uh, and also in an unadulterated way, live through experiences really fully. Whereas I often feel in our day-to-day -day lives, we have to hide how we feel. We have to kind of roll with the punches and, and whatnot. And as an actor, I'm given the freedom to be like emotionally open and available that you don't get elsewhere, you know, or, or not many places, I guess. So The Tangle, which is actually coming out today, which is exciting. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, was it hard getting into that character, Carter? Was it was it a process or how did you go about doing that? Because I watched it and I got to tell you, like some of those lines are phenomenal. It's poetic. Yes. So Chris, Christopher Soren Kelly, who wrote and directed it and stars in it opposite. I mean, the four of us, I think, are sort of the leads in it. Um, Chris is a poet. And so, and we're friends, deep, you know, deep, deep friends. And, um, and so when I read the script, what you're talking about was the first thing that struck me about Carter was in this world that where we all have this kind of dialogue, Carter's the artist. Carter is the 
I felt like the emotional core of what created the tangle and the need to have that kind of human element in it. So um, it was a really interesting thing because with the shaved head and the big beard, there's this sort of, I had some desire and want to be super tough because it looked super tough. But what Chris kept sort of pushing me towards was that poet, you know? So to me, that, that was the, the line that I got on, you know, that was the thing that started to carry me into stuff. And, and because of that, there was a tremendous amount of passion and fight and whatnot, but an intellect that was super, super high. So, uh, Luckily, Chris is smarter than I am. So he was able to write dialogue that allowed me to sound smarter than maybe I am. Uh, but, <laughs> but that to me was where Carter kind of lived in this sort of intellectual place who looked at violence as, as, the, as the tool of, of those who don't understand humanity, you know? I think Carter looked at it and thought, if we were all open, if we were all emotionally connected, violence would, would never occur. And that to me is where he get, got so involved in creating the tangle as, as an idea and then an ideology. And then obviously a thing we're all connected to. And also I think why being ousted from that world was so painful and pretty much put his life in ruins, you know? What's it like? What? Does it feel good? Do you feel trapped? Okay. The overrides are like a reflex. You know this, right? A pre-programmed arc. Okay, you scope a snake under your toe, you jump, right? Immediately. Reflex takes over. The tangle just adds another layer of reflex. I go to touch a hot stove. I can't. The tangle swerves my hand away. I trip. The tangle rolls me to safety. It's why we don't need to feel pain anymore. The tangle protects us instead. I go to strike someone, my arms would freeze. It would be impossible for I or anyone to kill someone. If you had to, how would you get around the overrides, Carter? I have no idea. You're an unusually intelligent person. But he's the micro-intelligence expert. Ask Mr. Nanobot. I'm the poet, remember? Once people watch this film, they're going to go, wow, that's just, wow. <laughs> it's really it's really hard to put into words without like ruining like the plot line and I don't want to do that because then I have lots of angry fans and I don't want, don't want I, to do that. I totally understand I mean it is it's dense you know it's a dense film that you got to pay attention to but I do feel like when you get into it it sort of takes you into a zone that that the, the music of the language starts to play. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. To get specific about the script, you just kind of ruin the whole thing, you know? Right. And, and so I've been trying to avoid any of those kind of spoilers in, in any interviews that I've been lucky enough to do. Obviously, that must have been a challenging role. What's, a, what's another challenging role that you've had an opportunity to play that really kind of brought you to, like, your limits? I mean, I loved every second of it. But when we shot the Pacific, um, that to me was at the time the deepest I think I'd ever gone into a character because of the relationships I had with the guys I was working with. We got so close that really the hardest part about the Pacific was when I wrapped and I had to leave Australia and come back home. I was, I was broken for like a month. It was John Seda who played Basilone. He came back at the end and he came to see me in a play I was doing at the Pasadena Playhouse. I was doing Of Mice and Men. And he said, I don't know what's going on. And I said, you have to say goodbye to Barcelona. And he, I could see him, his heart welling up and he went, I have to say goodbye to him. And that, that embodiment of a character for that length of time with those kind of close relationships um, was, it, it's a different kind of challenge. I don't know if it's exactly the challenge you know, that you're talking about, the one you're talking about, or I think you're talking about, I did a play out here called Dirty Filthy Love Story. It had my friend Rob Mersola played, and it was about two hoarders in this kind of twisted, dark comedy. And that character was such a deep dive and so physically and vocally different than me that I remember right before opening night, I turned to my cast 
because it was just three of us. And I turned to the other two actors and I went, well, I'm going to do this with no idea of how it would be received and really felt like I was out on the edge of a cliff and was, and was going to get pushed off and had to pray that there was water below. Um, and, and, <laughs> and, it, and it worked out. It did, the play did really well. You know, I was, uh, it, it seemed to be the performance was received well. But that was definitely that kind of risk where you just don't know how it's going to go, you know? <laughs> I've been on stage a few times. I definitely understand that where you're like, yikes. Like, I, I think I could do this. I know I could do this. But can I really do this? Yep. Yeah, That's... exactly. So you're also a coach. You yep. help coach people. Could you tell us a little bit about that as well? Well, probably the most interesting story I can tell are some of the people I coached. So in a, in a very weird series of events, I wound up being Eminem's acting coach on the set of Eight Mile. Yeah, that's the reaction people tend to have. Wow, that was unexpected. <laughs> yeah, I coached, I was on set for, for a month of rehearsals and then four and a half months or three and a half months of shooting in Detroit. Um, I coached the, the little girl in the film who played his little sister. Um, I coached some of the day player guys, some of the other rappers and hip hop artists who, who were, you know, local Detroit guys. Um, so I also had coached an actor named Columbus Short, who for a while had a really big booming career. And he was in a movie that Sean Puffy Combs saw. And he called him and said, how did you do that? And he said, I have a great coach. So then I once coached Puff Daddy and Puffy on two episodes of CSI Miami. And then CSI Miami called me once and asked me if I would coach Pau Gasol, who at the time was the center for the Lakers and an absolute gentleman. And so I coached him as well. Um, and then I run a school here in LA, my own little acting school. And I've got a number of students who are working and on some TV shows and stuff. So I, I've, it, I've been able, that's that, that, that for a long time is how I subsisted, you know, between acting jobs. And now it's just something I kind of do alongside my acting work because it's kind of become a part, I think, of who I am as, a, as an artist, you know. So you've had a chance to be on stage, on screen. You've had a chance to coach others who are on screen, and I'm assuming on stage as well. Um, what is a role that you wish you could have? If someone were to offer you a role, what would it be? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I'll tell you what I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to play Henry V in the Shakespeare play Henry V. And I want to do it because I'm not tall. I'm about five foot six, right? And I want my entire court to be men at least six foot three. I want them to be giants. And I want to sort of do this kind of Napoleonic, you know, little guy complex Henry V. Um, it's weird because the first three that come to mind are all Shakespeare. I would like to do the same playing Iago and have Othello be, like I have a former student, Anthony Alabi, who's on, um, uh, what's the name of the show? He's on a show, a comedy on Netflix, but he's a fantastic Shakespearean actor. And I want to do Othello with him. He's six foot seven. He was an NFL lineman and I just want to like have to literally stand on a stool to whisper in his ear. I just think it would be such a weird, crazy dynamic um, uh, for sure. I, there are two other things I really want to do and these are more on, on screen. So I had three big dreams as an actor, I think. It's kind of like the boy in me. I wanted to do something that was World War II, which I did with the Pacific. I really, really, really want to wield a sword or a battle axe in something. <laughs> Lord of the Rings kind of world. <laughs> I would, I, I'm, I, I'm a fantasy nerd. That's the kind of books that I read in my spare time. I would kill to do that. And then the other one is because I was a college baseball player, I would kill to play ball on screen. You know, I would love to play a ball player just because it's part of my heart. Well, maybe they'll make a version of League of Their Own for men. That would be... That they're, they're, that movie is one of my favorite movies of all time. I mean it. And I think, and one of the reasons I love it so much is they capture the heart of baseball as well as any film I've ever seen. Like those, those women are ball players. 
And it, that I cry when I watch that movie. I laugh when I watch that movie. I, I think that movie is amazing. So it, please, yes, a ver- with some kind of male version of A League of Their Own, I could be the old guy. You know what I mean? I could be the, <laughs> I don't care what it is. I would do it like, like that. <laughs> that's a joy. That makes me smile. Oh, that's fantastic. So who are so, who has been some of your favorite or most memorable people that you've worked with over these years that you've been doing this? Oh man, I, you know, that is a, <laughs> a chock full of good questions. I've been really lucky, you know, I mean, I mean, I got to work with Tom Hanks, you know, like the, the kindest, most generous guy in the world. Um, he hired me for the Pacific and then he gave me a role in the movie, Larry Crown. Um, He's just such a lovely guy. Um, I mean, the boys in the Pacific, John Bernthal, James Badgedale, John Seda, Josh Hellman, Jacob Pitts, uh, Ash Zuckerman. I mean, the list is so long. Those guys um, are family to me. You know, I did a show called One Dollar and that entire cast, uh, Sturgill Simpson, Ashley Atkinson, our director, Craig Zobel, our casting director, Allison Estrin, uh, John Carroll Lynch, like I've been really blessed because I've left a lot of sets with some real deal friends. And so I know that the, I feel like that question often is asked like of the famous people have you worked with, like obviously working with Eminem was amazing. He's an artist. He's a funny, funny guy. That cast too, Omar Benson Miller, Evan Jones, Mackay Pfeiffer, you know, these guys are, are, um, are just, absolute joys you know so but it's also like a lot of the friendships that i've made i have these really really deep friendships with people that i've been able to to work with uh that have really changed my life i do have to say and i said this someone asked me a question similar uh two of the nicest people you ever meet in this business are mark Harmon and ted danson they are as my grandmother would say they're menches they're really really it's a the yiddish word means like a really good person and they are so kind to everyone, cast, crew, you as a guest star actor on their set. Um, I, I mean, honestly, I could fill an hour of just going through people that I've worked for and with, you know. Um, I mean, to be honest, the one person I have to give a tremendous amount of credit to is William Esper, my, my mentor. He, he, you know, I got to work with him and he put me on a path that as a kid from Queens, New York City, telling me that I would ever refer to myself as an artist. I would have been like, you can't do that. What's wrong with you? You sound like, uh, you know, you sound all like hoity, you know? And, <laughs> and, and Bill taught me that I could be that kid from Queens who was an artist. And that feels really lucky. Joe Rizzo. Looks like the kind of guy who doesn't like getting beaten up by a woman. Look, you guys got this all wrong. I didn't kill Jenny. You knew her name? Yeah, of, of course. I was a regular at the bar. Every Friday night. I, I like Jenny. Oh. Oh, what? A plumber can't appreciate good entertainment? Why did she attack you then? We, uh, had a thing. Sexual? No, come on. She was a guy. Mm-hmm. No, our fight was about my credit card bill. Every Friday, there'd be these weird charges. And I never, ever used that card. But the account info was on my phone, so... You figured that Jenny used your phone at Madam Zappel. Yeah, she was always very attentive, you know, touchy. So I figured she pocketed it, used the account info to buy stuff, so... I asked her about it. Judging from her reaction, you didn't ask very nicely, did you? No, I deserved that beating. I was impolite. You are impolite. I called her a tranny. And I shoved her. I shouldn't have done that. But I was out almost 300 bucks, and I never did find out who stole the info, so. Bill, it's Hollywood. Officer Rogal, this is my homicide team, Moore, Johnson. What do you got? How can we help you? Uh, ID says Clifton Campbell, a driver of the Prius, Aubrey Stenstrom, was about to park when Mr. Campbell crashed into a car and then was blindsided by a white SUV. Mm-hmm. Texting while driving. Park one of those black and whites over here, block the view of the decedent. Pedestrian witness got a vehicle ID and a partial plate. Driver stopped then sped off. People hear that thud sound. Someone breaks in the head. Barrel! Check this out.
Officer Rogal, you need a little help with this? If you guys think that gun is some kind of clue, be my guess. As far as I'm concerned, I'm looking at a felony cap. Let me ask you something. Where were you before you came up here? Coffee room. How did you get here? What? What do you mean? Did you consume caffeinated dark beverages at 1,100 hours before commencing to proceed in an orderly fashion to the present location? Or did you walk here? We walked here. Do them again, in English. Actually, I was wondering about the part where she mentions me throwing up. You did. I know, but is it okay if she leaves that part out? See them? Either one of them goes in front of a jury, he's done for. You know why? The eyes. There's no one home. They'll look at you like they just as soon gut you as ask you the time. It doesn't make a difference if the prosecutor speaks gibberish, they're going away. But Nazir Khan, he doesn't look like them. He looks like any other normal college kid. So the jury's gonna wonder, could he really stick that knife into that girl? We have to fight that. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't understand. What's your first name? Robert. Officer Robert Maldonado. Fresh out of the academy, he goes into a crime scene and he comes out throwing up. Why shouldn't he? He's a new cop, just saw his first dead body. Now Nasser Khan may very well be a human being, but so was Andrea Cornish, and so was Robert Bobby Maldonado. So you throwing up? Absolutely. Keep it in. Now get out of here. Growing up, did you have a favorite TV show? Yeah, I'm trying. I remember, I mean, this is going to sound so silly. When I was like a little kid, my parents used to let my brother and I stay up late to watch two shows. One was Heart to Heart, um, which really is just like, a, a kind of schlocky, you know, whodunit <laughs> show, but kind of fun, and uh, and Dynasty. They would let us watch Dynasty with them. But the show that I was like really crazy about as a kid was the original Battlestar Galactica. Oh, that show blew me away. It was like it it, it 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 was like a walking comic book, you know. So it had that kind of mythological kind of thing because that that. Like I said, I was, I'm really into sort of, you know, fantasy novels, which started with a love of mythology, like Greek and Norse mythology. So when the movie Clash of the Titans came out, I thought someone had taken all of my fantasies and put them on a movie screen and I couldn't believe it, you know? Same thing with the Goonies. When the Goonies came out, I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to find a secret treasure, you know? Yes. Um, and I think to me that that is, that I think is the real joy in, uh, in acting is that, um, I get to enter, when I'm lucky enough, I get to enter into these worlds I would never walk and I get to live through these kind of fantasies. And then you watch them and they're all put together, you know? You watch the Pacific and I look like I'm in the middle of a war. And, you know, and how cool is that, you know? And also what an honor to tell the story of, of these real men and women, you know, who fought and fought alongside each other in a, a really brutal war. So um, I kind of went on a tangent I know I did that. Uh, <laughs> that's how my brain works sometimes. We like I like tangents. It, the better, more tangents you have, the better questions I could come up with. So tangents are good. So my producer decided, since you've been in thirty TV appearances, we wanted to do a speed round because we were very curious. So here are the rules: you have two minutes or less to try to answer these questions. So we'll try not to go on a tangent yet. Okay. So you ready? Yeah, I don't know what I'm in for, but let's do it. <laughs> they're not, they're, they're good questions. I've already read over them several times. <laughs> so you were in the second episode of Dennis Leary's The Job. According to IMDB, it was your second TV appearance. What do you recall from that show? Okay, I only have two minutes to answer all these, or this one? Uh, for each one, so two minutes okay. for each one. Okay, so what I'll tell you is this. I was, the casting director was a woman named, is a name, woman named A.V. Kaufman, one of the best casting directors in the business, and, and someone who really became like a big sister to me. And she had me come in 
to when they had the first six episodes, I went to a table read with the whole cast and myself and another actor, we read, her and I read all the guest stars. And I got to read this variety. I did like 10 accents and Dennis Leary leaned over and went like, who is that guy? And then, uh, and so they, they told me they were gonna try and find something for me in the show. And the episode that I got was basically like a weekend at Bernie's. I was a dead homeless guy that they flopped around. And I'll never forget Dennis Leary seeing me and going, is that the guy from the reading? And he goes, great, we get a super great actor and we make him play a dead guy. What is wrong with us? That's my, that's my number one memory from that show. <laughs> oh, that's a joy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number two. How about The Mentalist with Simon Baker? First of all, Tim Kang, his birthday had been coming up, so we want to know if you got a chance to wish him a birthday, happy birthday. And you were also together in Magnum P.I. What was that like for you? Okay. So first of all, I didn't wish Tim a happy birthday, so Tim, happy birthday. Uh, <laughs> Tim is like your consummate professional good guy. So when I showed up to work on Magnum P.I., Tim was like the first person to greet me. And we had these very intense emotional scenes together. And as a guest star, when you guest star on a show, you usually show up, you don't know anybody. It takes three days for anybody to know your name. Tim made me feel like I was a real member of that cast, like a regular member. And I had a gun to my head. I was going to kill myself. I was sobbing. Every single take, Tim showed up for me. He didn't, when the camera wasn't on him, and so when we turned around, I felt like I had to do that for him. An amazing experience. And also, I'm going to give a shout out to my friend, Sharif Atkins, who played my partner on that episode. And that is a fine, fine man and a fine, fine actor. Uh, the Mentalist was, was super fun. And what was fun about it was that it was almost like we were doing a pilot of, for a new cop show, which is what the crew said to us. They said, like, this feels like the new crew. And my friend Omar Daniels played one of the cops that I was working with, who I got into the fist fight with. And he's one of my dear, dear friends. So we had so much fun because the camaraderie we had walking in, you know, and then you have Simon, who's this kind of like, I mean, he's so smart. He operates at a high level, who would come in and, and, and all of a sudden you got to energetically like do a different dance than I was doing with Omar. And we're making every possible effort. Thanks. All right, thanks for calling. Everyone and his sister wants to know when we're making an arrest. All right, this is Rick Tork from the Santa Fe office. He's gonna help out while we're shorthanded. Hey, Dennis Abbott, thanks for coming. So how long were you in Santa Fe? Uh, just a year. I started out at CBI, made the jump to the federal side about the same time as Cho. And he's worked with Jane before. Enough to know the score. And what's that? He'll never tell you what he's up to. Whatever he does, you'll look like an idiot. And always keep your hand on your wallet. Well, you do know the man. All right, listen up. It's been reported there are two bodies in the basement of this house. There may also be evidence pertaining to as many as 10 homicides committed by the recently deceased individual known as Lazarus. Real name, Joseph Keller. We want to put these cases to bed, so that means break out the fine-tooth combs. Let's go. Paul Kiko made a call to a burner about 45 minutes ago. The location's inside HPD. Paul Kiko called a burner. It's here. Can you guys call it? Hello? Hello? Just answered. You can hang up, Higgins. Do good. Do good. Watch out, watch out. Whoa, 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 Jim, 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 Jim. Whoa, 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 whoa. Put the gun down. Don't come any closer. Dugan, listen to me. Don't do it. If he dies, Kino goes free. Stay back. Please. It's not too late. It is. They blackmailed me. And I, I crossed the line. I can't come back. You can. You can fix it. Help me put Akino away. What did you do with the evidence? A few years ago, she came to me out of her mind. I had tried 
everything to help her but tough love. So I cut her off. That was the last time I saw her. Not a day goes by that I don't wish I handled it differently. This time I will. Jim, we're, we're both getting another chance here. What's the point? Everyone's given up on me. I won't give up on you. It's over. Okay? Come on. It's over. Let me go. I don't want to be so hero. You played Grant Sullivan on Castle. What was it like to play Sully? Oh my God. First thing I got to tell you was this. The whole thing about Sully, right, is he was taking Stana's spot and she was meticulous and beautiful and I was this like slob. And that was a huge part of the character. My desk was a mess. One of my first scenes, Castle would come to talk to me and I would be eating a burger and then I would just put the burger down on a pile of paper. We counted. I ate 16 burgers. <laughs> Because I knew it would be funnier if I took a big bite and had it in my mouth. Sometimes I got to spit it out. But overall, I ate about 16 burgers. I was sick for like three days. Um, but I want to say this. Nathan Fillion, another one of the kindest dudes in this business. He's so funny. He's so funny. And that entire cast, um, they, give each other, they would give each other notes, which you don't see because they had no ego. They played together and they were like, you know, hey, Nathan, I think it's funnier if you come under with the line. He's like, you mean like this? And they're like, yeah, that. And he'd be like, got it. And then he would give you notes. And I was once doing this thing where I was writing things down and trying to hide it from him. And Nathan saw it and he went, hey, I see what you're doing. He's like, can I play with you here? And I was like, yep. And we made an entire bit out of this thing. It was, it was almost like doing improv comedy on a major TV set. It was awesome. It was really, really, really fun. Yo, Sully. Yeah. Check out this number and see how it connects with our victim. And let's start piecing together where he was before he wound up here. I'm on it. Meantime, I checked his voicemail and he had a bunch of angry messages yesterday from some chick. Said she would kill him if he didn't call her back. Said she would not be ignored. Uh-huh. A classic rabbit boiler. Stalker, gentlemen. An obsessed fan. Do we know who the caller is? Uh, I traced the number to an address downtown. Uh, name is... Uh, Geraldine Powers. Ger Geraldine Powers, yeah. I bet she even has a creepy shrine to him. Yeah, with Donald Trump. Whoa, what happened to Beckett's desk? That's Sully's desk now. Oh, uh, Mr. Castle, sorry if I came on a little strong back at the scene. I'm still trying to get the lay of the land here. Detective Beckett left some big shoes to fill. Yeah, she did. I see you filled her desk. Mr. Castle! And then Nathan did this thing um, on my first day. He goes, I want you to make it look like you're throwing a punch, like, need, like a lot of energy. And he stood like this. And then he wrote, tweet this out and say, had a rough start to, to my first day at Castle. Hopefully it gets better. And John Huerta was behind like this. And we sent this picture out. And I just thought, oh my God, what a playful place. Like what a playful place. That, that set was fantastic. So fun. <laughs> That sounds like a joy. So you've been getting, you mentioned already One Dollar. Can you tell us a little bit about that show and the recognition and how we can find that show? Yeah, One Dollar is streamable on CBS All Access. And we were one of their first shows. And to be honest, not a lot of people really saw it from what I could gather. But what an amazing experience. So Craig Zobel is our director and Craig directed every episode, which is rare in this, in the TV world. And he's a film director. He's a, he's a celebrated independent film director. So that set operated with such play, you know, uh, and it's, it takes place in um, a, like a small steel town outside of Pittsburgh, run down because the steel industry has gone. And there's been this murder called the Seven Bloods where these seven people, they, they don't even have bodies. They just forensically find out that there's blood from seven different people in the middle of the steel, steel mill. And 
it's a, it's a mystery in that regard. But what was so cool about it was that our director really wanted to create like a Robert Altman real feeling situational life. So each episode, there was a dollar bill and that dollar bill had this number on it, which was important for the mystery. We didn't, you didn't know that, but you find that out. Every episode, that dollar bill through like someone paying for something or dropping it would get in the hands of a different person. And that episode would then center around that person's point of view of the town, of the people. So it was this ever-changing perspective. And cinematically, Craig and our DP Darren had rules for each episode. There was one episode where the kid with the, there was a kid with the dollar bill. So no camera was ever higher than four feet off the ground. So it was always looking from like almost a kid's perspective. And they, were, and they did things with like, it was the most, like watching them as filmmakers was a, was a, a lesson. Watching Craig Zobel work with actors and being one that he worked with was a joy. He was so playful. He gives notes constantly and he whispers them in your ear. So that means that the other actors don't know what's coming, which makes you have to listen because you don't know what he said to them either. And if you miss it, you missed it. So it really kept us on our toes in such a fun, playful way. One of my favorite experiences, actually. And I walked away with like seven lifelong friends. Easy, you know, super cool. All right, we're almost done, but this one you could take your time on. The Pacific that was produced by Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. It was the most expensive series made for cable TV. What was it like to be a part of that sequel of Band of Brothers? And do you have any memorable stories about being on set or anything about the cast or the crew? I mean... I mean, like I said, you could take your time on this one, so... The greatest experience of my life. Not just as an actor, but my like one of the greatest experiences I've ever had. Flew to Australia, had a 10 day boot camp in, uh, in the Daintree rainforest. There was a Japanese boot camp. And we could hear them in the jungle. Sometimes it, we didn't know what time, but it must have been three o'clock in the morning. A, a machine gun would open up and we would have to run and man our weapons and, and, and operate. Um, I had, I was part of a, a crew that, that had to hunt a sniper in the jungle. Um, we, we, I'll tell you a great story. This is my favorite boot camp story. So on the first day of, of boot camp, James Badgedale, who plays Lecky, offered me a cigarette. And I said, oh man, I don't smoke. And he just laughed. And the way he laughed, I looked at him, I was like, what are you laughing about, man? Like, what are you laughing about? And he just kind of chuckled and walked away. My character was a sergeant and about four days into boot camp, those of us who were NCOs, we got promoted to like squad leaders or platoon leaders. So we became responsible for guys. And, and our, our platoon was the machine gun platoon, right? Which had Lecky, it had um, Chuckler, it had Runner, it had Hoosier, it had Basalone, it had me, it had, it had Evans. Um, it had, it had a, lot of, a lot of the principal guys. And we were terrible, like the worst. We were told by Captain Die, like machine gunners, I am not impressed. And then he would just walk away and our heads would hang in shame. So we have this day where we're hunting this, we get attacked by a sniper and we have 65 men on, on this snaking line through the jungle. And we're like hand signals and everybody's ducking down. And you know, you're shooting blanks, but I'm diving through the jungle and we, the machine gunners, we are moving as a unit. We're moving these three machine guns and we take down, you know, we catch the, we kill the sniper and we all feel really good about ourselves. And we come back to our base camp and one of the Marines, real combat Marine who was training us gets in all of my guys' faces. You effing know me and you effing know me and you think you were hot shit out there. And like, and I'm watching these guys one by one just sink. They finally feel good about themselves. And now I feel like, like it's my responsibility to take care for them because I'm in charge or one of the guys in charge. And I snap. I go, this mother. And I start to go to confront this real Marine who would have killed me, I'm sure. And Lecky, Badge, and runner, Keith Knobs, they just appeared out of nowhere. Each put their arms around my shoulder, one on my left one, they went, oh, no, no, Morgan, no, 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 no. 
and they walked me away and I was seething and they walked me out to a machine gun pit and I turned a badge and I went, give me a cigarette. And he laughed and he goes, I told you. And I smoked that cigarette with him in this little machine gun hole. And, and it was this beautiful moment for the three of us. We like talked and we laughed, but he knew, he just knew, yeah, this guy's going to snap and he's going to need one of these one day. Um, but that show, I mean, John Seda, John Bernthal, Ian Meadows, you know, guys, Eamon Farron, um, Arkosh, guys who were in my platoon, we became family, Sammy. And uh, I remember when John Seda and I in the third episode were filming our goodbye scene and he was going to go on to shoot the rest of the series and, you know, Morgan kind of leaves the story. When we would shoot, there would always be like, 60 people that we knew, like the extras were guys who were in boot camp with us. But this was now three episodes in, and the guys who were dressed up at this airfield were no one we knew. And it was just John and I. And I'll never forget it. We were waiting to shoot the scene, and John Seda sits down next to me, and we can't even look at each other because we feel like brothers and we're saying goodbye. It wasn't our last scene, but it was like 10 days before I was leaving, so we could feel it. And he just went, eh, big scene today, huh? And I was like, yep. And we couldn't make eye contact. So on my first close-up, John's off camera. The camera's like right in my face. And John starts sobbing as he's saying goodbye to me, like sobbing. And now as he's sobbing, I completely lose it. And I'm like, I can't look at him, but I'm turning this way and that way. Tears are streaming out of my face. And Jeremy, our director, comes up and he goes, good, good job. And then he pokes me in the shoulder and he goes, now try and keep that in. Now I... Don't remember saying this, but Jeremy told it to Keith Nobbs when they were on set the next day. Apparently my response was, yeah, good luck. <laughs> and then I turned to John Seda and I went, John, what the F was that? And he goes, ha, ah, I thought I'd get you. And, and then we wound up shooting like to me at that time was one of the most beautiful scenes I, I ever really shot. That's the most thing about Jet Navy sails up and down the slot every night and plasters us. That don't got nothing to do with her. You know, the only radio reports I want to hear is that a bunch of Jap ships have been sunk somewhere off some crappy island called Guadalcanal. But then we need the Navy for that, wouldn't we? So fat chance. Come on. Hey, hey. So the Japs got us around. Is that what's bugging you? JP's in a bad mood, Manny. Next we'll be complaining about the mosquitoes. Come here. Hot child, cheer you up. Cheryl coming with me. I think that's you. There are a lot of other stories, like stories of us hanging out, John, John Bernthal and I and, and all the guys. And some of those I can't repeat because they're just, there they're are like little special moments. But it was the greatest experience. Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg and Tony Toe, our executive producer on set. David Nutter, one of our directors, Tim Van Patten, Jeremy, as I mentioned, like these people set up a world that you just couldn't help but live in. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm, it sounds cheesy, but I'm really truly blessed to have been a part of that. Thank you. Last question. In a perfect world, a new TV show that premieres in 2021 and it stars you what kind of show is it? Can you tell us anything about it? It's Are you asking me what the show would be? Um, I would, I would love to play some, like I was saying before, some like battle axe wielding clan leader in some world where magic exists. Um, and, and I have to kind of ride that 
wave where you don't know whether I'm going to survive or not, uh, I would kill to do that. I, uh, that would be so much fun. And if it was something that was written with like, you know, some of the depth of Game of Thrones or a show like that, where it's not just entertaining, but it also makes you think and feel, uh, you know, I, that would that would be everything to me. I, I that would be so much fun, and the, just the the battle prep, and you know, because then if you know, you mentioned earlier that I was an athlete, which is true. Which, funny enough, John Bernthal and I realized without knowing each other that when we were in college, we played college baseball against each other. <laughs> but that kind of athlete mentality of mine gets off on that's why boot camp as hard as it was for the Pacific was something I loved. I would love to go in that kind of physical training, you know, uh, that would be, if anybody out there is going to do a show like that, I'm calling, I'm in, I'm super in. <laughs> you, you know, you could always produce something just saying like, mm -hmm. there is that. Um, I've actually started to venture into that path. We'll see how it leads. I won't talk about much of it, but there's some things that, where uh, a few friends of mine and I are cooking up and, uh, and we'll see what, where it goes, but um, that would be even cooler to be part of the artistic creation of it, then get to live in it, then get to deliver it to an audience. Yeah. That'd be super fun. <laughs> well, now we have an idea of what's might be coming next for you. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. That was tons of fun speaking with you. You've done so much and I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming out and doing this. And The Tangle is a movie that everybody should go see. It's an amazing murder mystery noir. And if you have any questions about that film, just go see it and you'll have even more questions and it's worth it. Semi-intelligent nanobots filled the air, the soil, our blood, a hard drive grown in our brains, and everyone was connected, and violence eliminated. I go to strike someone, my arms would freeze. It would be impossible for I or anyone to kill someone. So thank you for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Real pleasure, honestly. What a fun talk. It felt like I was talking to an old friend. This has been Sam Hedden with producer Andy Watson. And now you know Joshua Baton. Thank you guys, real pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.